Today on Mike's Monthly Mix, we're talking about the biggest album releases from January and February 2022. And I'll only yell about the new Spoon album for 20 minutes. You are now listening to 103.5 Don FM. Expectations are a funny thing, aren't they? You go to the store to pick up some shredded cheese as a snack. You come back and realize it's not shredded cheese, it's actually the new Weekend album. And you put on the new Weekend album, and it's an 80 city pop dance floor record centered around a fictional radio station leading you to your glorious death, and it has too many flaky bits at the bottom. Oh wait, sorry, it was shredded cheese the whole time. Dawn FM is the follow-up to 2020's After Hours, the Weekend's best album in my opinion, an album that fell free to wallow in Abel Tesfaye's signature sorrows while laying on some stellar pop hooks, including Blinding Lights, a song that started playing in early 2020 and has not stopped playing since. And Dawn FM feels like the weekend's attempt to hammer down on the things that made After Hours work. A full album mainly co-produced by Max Martin and Daniel Lopatin, otherwise known as 10 Tricks Point Never. Imagine telling a young Victorian child that the guy who made Garden of Delete would one day work with the guy who produced Baby One More Time. Not only is this Abel's most club-ready album, but what's more, it's his most optimistic. Oh, oh don't get me wrong. The Weeknd still has that dummy thick haze of sorrow and self-pity surrounding his persona, but there are moments, faint as they may be, where he clearly shows that he wants to be better. This plus the whole guided death angle gives the whole album a new kind of drama that After Hours and the albums before didn't have, or at least didn't have in the same way. And am I detecting the faintest hint of Daft Punk on Sacrifice? That hella processed guitar hook makes me feel like I'm staring face to face with the robots themselves. The production throughout is great, but the transitions on this are stunning. The company involved must have been demonically possessed to come up with stuff like the transition from best friends to is there someone else. And when I first heard the way How Do I Make You Love Me gradually leads into Take My Breath, my jaw almost hit the floor. Abel's not alone on this though. We've got guest appearances from Tyler the Creator, Quincy Jones, Lil Wayne, but you know which guest gets the best spotlight? Jim Carrey. Dr. Eggman himself is on this album as the... I guess all-knowing disc jockey guide. And he even gets his own song as the closer, where he drops some emotionally affecting bars. Altogether, Dawn FM is great. I don't know if I'd say it's better than After Hours, but I have been replaying it in the weeks since it came out more than I did After Hours. If you haven't checked it out yet, give Sacrifice a listen. FKA Twigs released her follow-up to 2019's acclaimed Magdalene, a mixtape called Capra Songs. I think the mixtape angle suits the artist formerly known as Twigs quite well. This particular project feels free than her past albums did, more willing to invite new sounds and new guests into the fray. And while it may not be her best album, it might be her most welcoming. Check out Minds of Men. Nas followed up last year's excellent King's Disease 2 with Magic, another album fully produced by Hit Boy. If you've enjoyed either King's Disease 1 or 2, then you'll enjoy this one too. It's two gents who are good at what they do, showcasing how and why they're good at what they do. I really enjoyed 4016 Building. Gunna's got a new album out, DS Forever. It's fine. The beats are consistent in quality. The overall production aesthetic is well made. That's really all I got. After the near hour long runtime, I was less DS forever and more DS for a few minutes after it ended. Check out Push and P, cause I like alliteration and memes. Folk singer Anais Mitchell released her latest album nearly a decade after her last. If you're wondering what she's been doing that whole time, may I interest you in one of her timeshares in Hades Town? Anais has already planted her stake in the ground as a legendary songwriter, and this new album just reaffirms that status. For any fans of folk music or the recent output from Aaron Desner, even Taylor Swift. This would be right up your alley. Check out Revenant. Rapper Corday dropped his second album from a bird's eye view. I had never really paid much attention to Corday before this, but this album is not only literally sound, it's also technically sound. If you're a fan of J. Cole or that kind of conscious, understated hip hop, I think you would like this one a good deal. Check out Champagne Glasses with Freddie Gibbs and Stevie Wonder. Earl Sweatshirt dropped his fourth studio album, Sick. I've seen some in the discourse say this is a letdown from some rap songs and Feet of Clay. I could not disagree more. This is the most I've enjoyed Earl in years. It's got the same singular production of those past two records, but there's a newfound focus in the hooks and delivery. Plus, this thing does not waste your time. It's only 24 minutes. It's a great album. Check out Fire in the Hole. The piano on the outro is gorgeous. British electronic producer Burial recently unearthed himself with a new EP, Anti Dawn. Despite that classification, it's the length of a full-length album. And it uses every minute. This is a record that heavily relies on atmosphere. You may not immediately click with it, but set aside time, turn off the light, 
websites, really immerse yourself in it, and you'll find something pretty rewarding here. I'd say New Love is the best entry point for this one. I don't know what I expected from this new Bastille album, Give Me the Future, but I know for sure I did not expect a concept album about modern technology that sounds like their take on the 1975. Would I call it good? Sure, though I kinda wish Bastille would give themselves more freedom to experiment and not make the usual bombastic pop songs. Compared to their biggest songs like Pompeii, I closed my eyes and it felt like nothing changed at all. But much like the 1975, I gotta commend them for trying. Also, it's always fun to be reminded that Riz Ahmed does music. Give Back to the Future a listen. And speaking of Pompeii, Welsh avant pop musician Kate Le Bon released her sixth album, Pompeii. It's a pretty diverse record. A ton of people have compared it to Berlin era David Bowie. For me, Something doesn't click. I think I just need to stew longer in this album's volcanic juices. But even I can't resist a track like Moderation. Excellent baseline on that one. Indie pop legends Animal Collective released Time Skiffs, their 11th album. I'm mixed on this. I haven't had the time to dig into much of Anko's discography. I, I know and like the big heavy hitters, but that special connection that so many have with them just isn't there for me yet. But still, this new record is often gorgeous and occasionally dealt severe emotional damage. I really enjoyed Strung with everything. Black Country New Road released their hotly anticipated sophomore album, Ants From Up There. I'll tell you what's also up there, this thing's critical reception. Everyone loves it, because it's good. Could you imagine if everyone loved a not good album? <laughs> That'd be so embarrassing. My reaction was a little bit more muted though. I think it's great, but the wow factor of this band for me came from their first album. And this new album's biggest accomplishment, in my eyes, is translating the frantic live energy captured on the first record and crafting a thorough emotional journey in album form. If they ever get tired of being a rock band, BCNR would write an amazing musical. Even though their lead singer is departing the band, I think BCNR have a bright future ahead. Check out Bread Song. All right, what's up next? Yeah! It's a coffin to tonight. You're gonna wanna sit down before I tell you this. Spoon's new album, Lucifer on the Sofa, is very good. Take a second, please. You must be shocked. I should lay out my bona fides. Spoon is currently my favorite band working today. And a Spoon album being good is not newsworthy in and of itself. It'd be like someone breathlessly telling you that the earth is spinning. So allow me to tell you why it's so cool that the earth is spinning. Lucifer has gotten a lot of comparisons to the band's output in the early 2000s, the period where they really found their artistic voice. And I think that's a fair comparison. The whole album grooves and saunters in the same way that the fitted shirt or the way we get by does. But I'll push on that even further. I think this album is a culmination of everything Spoon has done up to this point. The abrasive punk rock of their first two records, the emotional vulnerability that's shown through on Girls Can Tell, Transference, and They Want My Soul, the studio tomfoolery of Ga 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 and Kill the Moonlight, and the art house dance of Gimme Fiction and Hot Thoughts. And yet, just like all the records before it, Lucifer on the Sofa sounds like its own thing. I can't think of how lead single The Hardest Cut would have fit on past records with that wrecking ball of a distorted guitar. Or Wild with its boisterous chorus and Jack Antonoff co-write. The swagger of Feels Alright, Satellite finally getting a studio version after years of being a live cut, and the closing title track feeling like the love child of New York Kiss and everything hits at once with some of the sacks from us coming together as the best closer they've made in years. I gotta stop there, otherwise this will turn into me actually yelling about this album for 20 minutes straight. Lucifer on the Sofa is another damn fine addition to Spoon's stellar discography, and I urge you to check it out ASAP. If I had to pick just one track to check out, I, I would say Wild. Electro pop connoisseurs Joywave put out their latest album, Cleanse. Are you a fan of synth pop with societally conscious subject matter? Then you'll really dig this. If you don't, have you heard the new Spoon yet? Check out the inversion. Rapper and singer Saba dropped his third album, Few Good Things, which follows his very well-received 2018 album, Care For Me. Saba's music is the kind that I love when it's described on paper, and then it enters my ear holes, and I'm like, okay. Very well-produced music with a deep emotional core, and yet I feel like I'm at arm's distance whenever I listen. But that's a personal thing. Lots of people are enjoying this, and there's clearly a ton of care and attention put into it. Check out Fearmonger. Big Thief released their highly anticipated fifth album, Dragon New Warm Mountain I I believe in you. Really trying to maximize that SEO, aren't you? This is the band's first double album, The Biggest Thief, if you will. And as I expected, it's very good. But it's very good in a lot of new, unexpected ways. Many of the songs feel 
up front. The kind of hypnotic songwriting from UFOF is still here, but the melodies feel way more immediately memorable. And some tracks like Wake Me Up to Drive feel sonically foreign on a Big Thief album. But I am not complaining, the overall journey is well worth taking. Blue Eyes White Dragon, I Believe in the Heart of the Cards is a keeper and one I'll be listening to for months, if not years. I recommend Simulation Swarm. Everyone's favorite keystroke, Alt-J is back with a new album, The Dream. Their last album, Relaxer, was very weird with a lot of experiments that didn't fully work for me. It also had one of the worst snare drums I've ever heard on a song called, ironically enough, Hit Me Like That Snare. The Dream is a course correction, as it's probably their most mature sounding album yet. Not my favorite from them, in case you didn't see the grip and awesome wave has on my neck, but if you've ever enjoyed Alt-J, or if you want some well-constructed art pop and indie rock, check out the actor. Shamir released his latest album, Heterosexuality. You might know that name from the 2014 hit on the regular, but according to interviews, this new record was conceived as a reckoning towards that song, Shamir's sudden rise to fame, and the general concept of identity. The resulting songs are excellent, and and they all showcase Shamir's distinctive voice very well. If you enjoy Moses Sumney, especially his album from 2020, I think you'll really enjoy this. And if you want a taste, check out Cold Brew. Iconic dream pop duo Beach House have a new album out, Once Twice Melody. They've been releasing this one as EPs over the past few months. Personally, I'm not huge into that kind of approach. I like my album releases how I like my interventions, sudden and all at once. Thankfully, none of that matters now because the full album is here and it is great. I didn't think I would like a Beach House album again as much as is their last album, Seven, but this one really feels like the culmination of every record they've done up until now. One second you're enveloped in one of their signature synth soirees, the next you'll be bobbing your head to some explosive hooks. It feels like them entering a new phase in their career, and I'm excited to see wherever they go from here. Check out Over and Over. Pearl Jam's frontman, Eddie Vedder, released his third studio album, Earthling. It's basically a Pearl Jam album, though guest spots from Stevie Wonder and Elton John are fun. That said, I've always liked it when Eddie would branch out a bit from Pearl Jam's sound, like the Into the Wild soundtrack. But I'm also a bit biased. I can't help being a card-carrying fan of ukulele songs. Check out Long Way. When I see Snot's name on Twitter, I keep thinking it's some kind of meme cryptocurrency. But to my surprise, he's a rapper with a new album called Ethereal. You know what else is Ethereal? The production on this. Despite the bare bones beats, it's a fairly diverse sounding album. Unfortunately, I don't remember a single thing Snot or anyone else said on this entire project. Except for Doja, that, that one was catchy. 2 Chains has a new album out, his last trap album Album, according to the man himself. And if this is his swan song, it's okay. It's perfectly acceptable and it doesn't overstay its welcome. But every beat and bar on this record could have been ripped straight from the mid 2010s. I liked pop music the most, but still, I'm not gonna remember much about this one. When Japanese singer songwriter Hikaru Utada walked away, you didn't hear me say, please, oh baby, don't go. But simple and clean is the way their latest album, Bad Mode, is making me feel tonight. It's hard to let it go. Check out the title track. Either I just came from a 45 minute shower cry sesh or a new Mitski album dropped. Actually, wait, I think it's both. Laurel Hell is Mitski's sixth studio album and her first since her breakthrough in 2018, Be the Cowboy. And in my opinion, it's good. It's not mind blowing and it's not as wildly diverse as her last album was, but Mitski is a great songwriter and any chance to hear songs by her is welcome in my opinion. Though lead single Working for the Knife had me concerned for a hot sec. It made me think that the whole album would be a basic retread of Cowboy, but with the full album in context, I think this was the perfect lead single. Any other song off this record, especially the synth pop tracks Stay Soft or Love Me More, might have led some to pinning Mitski right out the gate as a gasp, shock, horror, sellout. Many of these songs sound like spiritual successors to uh, Nobody off Be The Cowboy, and I, I don't mean that as a bad thing. I love that song. Some people say that Should've Been Me sounds like Mario Kart music. Sorry, I should've been more specific. They mean that as a bad thing? Don't mind me, I'll just be over here imagining Mitski dropping bars over Dolphin Shoals. In at least one way, Laurel Hell reminds me of Dawn FM. These are two albums that are in some part about someone trying to move into a new stage of their life, into a new version of themselves. And putting aside musical output, that's always worth commending. But it comes back to that idea of expectations. Once you've made a record like After Hours or Be the Cowboy, one that feels like the pinnacle of everything you've done up to that point, it can be very tricky to follow it 
it up. And following it up can be a lose-lose situation. You try to make the same record as the one that got you attention, you're pegged as a one-trick pony. You try to make something bigger in scope, it could blow up in your face. You try to scale back and get weird, and you risk making something where the pieces break apart too easily in your hand. Wait a goddamn second. I don't know if this record is gonna age well or if I'll return to it much, but I also know calling this album an L or mid on Twitter a week or two after it's out is no way to live. Point is, the discourse void will consume us all in the end, and Laurel Hell is a good album. I would recommend checking out The Only Heartbreaker. So those were the biggest records from the past two months, and it was enough for an entire year. Look forward to the rest of this year being just Donda 4 and the Gummy Bear reboot. The last time that the first two months of the year were as stacked as this were, in my opinion, 2020, right before everything shut down. While I don't want to say anything that could change things, that could be an optimistic sign of where things are going this year. Or, you know, feel free to quote me in a few months and laugh when COVID-7 drops. If I had to narrow down the past two months to just three albums that I think you should check out, I would say Spoon's Lucifer on the Sofa, Big Thief's Dragon New Warm Mountain, I Believe in You, and Earl Sweatshirt's Sick. And if you have any thoughts on the records I covered, or if there's one that I missed that you would recommend, let me know in the comments.